Welcome back, everybody. It is April 23rd, 2022, and we are continuing our series, Following in the Footsteps of Jesus. And today we are talking about surrender, adjust, and obey. Our scripture is Galatians 2, 20, and it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we just come before you again into your presence, seeking to walk with you, to follow in your footsteps, acknowledging, Lord, that it will not be easy because we will fight against our very natures and it will require surrender on our part and adjusting to what you ask us to do and obeying. Lord, may we have the courage to do just that and may we trust you with everything that we have and everything that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Here is the list of scriptures that we will follow and as always, I encourage you to go to the PDF version of this sermon for the notes. Okay. Surrender, adjust, obey. At the center of our life of discipleship is Jesus. We have chosen to hold fast to, to cling to, to bond to, to attach ourselves to, to be faithful to him. But this is only a part of the equation because the very essence of the Christian life is not to just hold fast to Jesus, but to become like him. Paul saw that the formation of Christ in the life of a believer was his primary mission. Notice what he said. Romans chapter 12, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. 2 Corinthians 3, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness. And Galatians 4.12, excuse me, 4.19, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. But before we can even begin to grow into Christ-likeness, there are a few things that we have to commit to doing every day, every moment of the day, multiple times a day. Surrender, adjust, and obey. First one, surrender. Have you ever heard the saying, God is my co-pilot? It sounds all nice and spiritual, doesn't it? But is it really? If God is only the co-pilot, that makes me the pilot. I remain in control of my situation and only call on him when I can no longer control the plane on my own. This is definitely a very human view of surrender. God's view of surrender is that we hand the controls over to him and go and sit in the back of the plane and enjoy the complimentary beverage service. This makes us very uncomfortable, and it will require an adjustment in our thinking. Because what if he takes us somewhere we don't want to go? What if the landing is bumpier than we'd like? What if the plane crashes and things just simply don't turn out as we expected them to? 
Listen to the words of Ken Geyer from his amazing little book, Windows of the Soul. This is what he writes. It came the summer of my senior year in high school when I was at a Young Life camp in Colorado. During a 20-minute time of silence, after one of the evening messages, I felt compelled to answer Christ's love as it called to me from the cross. That night, while sitting under a tree, I answered that call with my life, thinking my life would be of little use to him, but still, if he wanted it for something, it was his for the taking. Answering that call seemed so natural. So much had been given. So little had been asked in return. How could I not entrust my life to so great a love? And yet, somewhere in the subterranean places of my heart flowed a very quiet but very real fear of trusting too much. I feared that if I got too serious about my relationship with God, that if I got close enough to where he could see the whites of my eyes, he might call me from the crowd, call me by name, send me somewhere I didn't want to go. I remembered the story of Jonah. That could be me if I wasn't careful how I worded things. He might send me to Nineveh. I remembered the story of Abraham too. What if God asked me to take a knife to all the Isaacs in my life? You get on a first name basis with God and who knows what could happen to you? In order for this transfer of power to be successful, we have to go limp. Now, lifeguards know that it is virtually impossible to save a drowning person who struggles and fights against his rescuer. The only way to be rescued is for the victim to go limp, to surrender. Only then can the lifeguard put his arms around him and pull him to safety. As long as the victim fights, he is destined to drown. But that's exactly what God wants from us. He wants us to give up our insistence on being the directors of our own destinies, to our self-determination, to our you're not the boss of me, thinking. And go limp, surrender in his arms, trusting in his promises and ability to fulfill his plans and purposes in our lives, even if they don't quite look like what we had imagined. Because truth be told, not a single plan that you can come up with holds a candle to the plan God has for you. In David McCaslin's biography on Oswald Chambers, he recounts a period in Oswald's life when he experienced a great struggle over his life's work, the direction God wanted to take him, and the surrender of his life to God. This period lasted for four years. Listen to what he says. Finally, the long night was over and peace had come. The citadel of his heart had fallen, not to a conquering Christ, but to the gentle knocking of wounded hands. Chambers' crisis of full surrender to God in 1901 profoundly altered his life. The things he once held dear were willingly sacrificed and traded for complete reliance upon God. And then, and then he quotes Oswald, 
All I have to do is come as a spiritual pauper, Chambers said, not ashamed to beg, to let go of my right to myself. It is never do, 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 and you'll be with the Lord, but be, 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 and I will do through you. It is a case of hands up and letting go, and then entire reliance upon Him. Is this too much to ask for Je- from Jesus? No, it's not too much to ask. Why? Because He surrendered everything to His Father for you. Notice Galatians 1, grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God the Father. Philippians 2, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, and he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Surrender will require us to adjust and obey. But before we get to adjust, look at this. I love this little cartoon drawing. The little man is, has his heart. It's all I have. And Jesus says, it's all I want. That's a perfect example of surrender. All right, on to adjust, adjustment. Anytime you move from where you are to where God wants you to be, or from your way of thinking to God's way of thinking, adjustments will be required in order to follow him. Noah had to adjust his life in order to do what God asked him to do. He surrendered, adjusted, and obeyed, and an ark was built. Abraham had to adjust his life to where God wanted him to go. He surrendered, adjusted, and obeyed, and a nation was born. Moses had to adjust his life in order to become the leader that God needed. He surrendered, adjusted, and obeyed, and a nation was delivered. The disciples had to adjust their lives in order to become the missionaries that God needed. They surrendered, adjusted, and obeyed, and a world was evangelized. And that brings us to obey or obedience. Unfortunately, Christians have reduced obedience to following a set of rules. But obedience is more than law keeping. Christian obedience is grounded in our relationship with a person. And that person is Jesus. As we've noted in the past, obedience is the walk of faith, getting up and going where God wants us to go, doing what He wants us to do, trusting that He will work out the details. In World War II, an elite group of soldiers was formed, known as the paratroopers. The goal of the paratrooper was to drop behind enemy lines and have the ability to move quickly and independently against the enemy. 
Of course, part of a paratrooper's training was jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. When the green light went on, each soldier jumped without pause, without doubt, without reflection, without questioning. Green light on, go. If a paratrooper hesitated at the door, he was washed out of training and sent to the worst possible alternative, which was, in their minds, the infantry. It was not at the door that the soldier decided whether or not to jump. That was not the time to question if the plane was going in the right direction, at the right speed, at the right height, or to begin a debate on whether the stick had been really ordered to jump. Now the stick was all of the, all of the soldiers, all of the paratroopers in the plane that were about to jump, they were called the stick. So at the door wasn't the time to say, are we sure that we were supposed to jump? or insist that the jump be smooth and the landing comfortable, or wonder if jumping is really the safest thing to do. The only relevant question for the paratrooper was, did you sign up to be a paratrooper? If the answer was yes, then you jumped out the door without reservation or hesitation. The only relevant question for the Christian is, did you choose to follow Jesus? If the answer is yes, then you wait when he says wait. You stop when he says stop. And you go when he says go. Obedience is not a checklist. It's a way of life. Notice what Bill Hull says, beyond calling us to follow Jesus, to follow, Jesus also described the nature of the commitment that we need to have in following him. My whole life is the answer to Jesus' call. He calls, I answer, not just in words, but in the action of following. George MacDonald noted, instead of asking yourself whether you believe or not, ask yourself whether you have this day done anything because he said do it, or once abstained because he says don't do it. It is simply absurd to say you believe, or even that you want to believe in Jesus if you don't do anything he tells you to do. Surrender, adjustment, obedience go hand in hand on our journey of discipleship. We surrender, adjust, and obey. And as we do, Jesus reveals more and more of himself to us. And we grow. We mature. We become more like him. Notice, notice these few quotes here. God does not want obedience as the fruit of our willful determination. God wants surrender as the choice of the heart. For what we long for in our heart, we will pursue with the totality of our being, not simply with the resolve of our will. And this, moving into a place of surrender, will move you into a place of obedience which will unlock a passion inside you that will move you to action. Notice Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure 
of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that is my closing wish for you today, that you will come to know the glorious riches of God. Amen. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.